and welcome. Hi, I'm Allison Hart. I'm the CEO of the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for being here today for our Government Affairs Forum. This is one of my favorite sessions that we have every year, the 2013 Legislative Session Review. It's where we're able to hear from our legislators uh, what has happened during the session, how that impacts our businesses, and to give you a chance to interact with them as well and let them know what's on the minds of our business community here in East County. So thank you for being here today. I want to thank our, our sponsors for this particular program, the Forum. We want to thank particularly Riverview Community Bank that is our uh, presenting sponsor and Larry um, is here with us from Riverview, so thank you Larry for being here. The Gresham Borough School District has been a um, um, supporting sponsor for a long time to bring education to our members um, and PGE is also our registration sponsor and Metro East Community Media who does film this particular program and then rebroadcast so we want to thank them for being involved. I'd also like to acknowledge our elected officials who are here with us. Uh, Metro Councilor Shirley Craddock, thank you for being here. Gresham Mayor Shane Bemis, thank you for being here, and uh, Gresham City Council Lori Stegman, thank you so much. Uh, I'd also like our, our chamber leadership and board members just raise their hand and thank you for your dedication and um, for the work that you do to help the strategic direction and goals of the chamber. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Andre Wang to uh, introduce our prestigious guests, and Andre is also on our board and the chair of our Government Affairs Committee. So thank you, and we welcome you to our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Well, it's been 15 days since the end of the legislative session, and this, this session had all the makings of a Shakespearean drama. Everything from PERS reform to the CRC to dog tethering. So one bill that actually germinated here in East County was um, SB 678. This, um, this bill expanded the uh, remedy for workers' comp cases uh, to uh, limited liability companies. This legislation was particularly meaningful to businesses here in our region, and uh, we want to uh, just take a moment to thank uh, Senators uh, Laurie Montez Anderson, Senator Chuck Thompson, and Representative Greg Matthews for carrying the banner on that bill um, and its passage. So thank you very much. Today we, um, uh, we have East County's entire legislative delegation before you, and they're here to give you uh, the reflections on the session and answer your questions. Uh, but first, we'll have them give their opening remarks. Each uh, representative and, and senator will have seven minutes uh, to give us their update. And we'll go in the order of their legislative district. So first up, representing um, House District 49 is Chris Gorsick, from, uh, representing Troutdale, Fairview, Wood Village, and North Gresham. Elected in November of 2012, Representative Gorsick first, just completed his first session and served on the Education Committee, Higher Education and Workforce Development Committee, and vice, served as Vice Chair of the Transportation and Economic Development Committee. Representative Gorsick is an instructor at Mount Hood Community College and has served as a Portland police officer and also a term on the Trout Dell City Council. So to give us his reflections on this first legislative session, please welcome Representative Chris Gorsick. Well, good morning. How is everybody today? It's a beautiful day. Um, it is odd to be a freshman when you're 55 years old, I just have to tell you. Um, Shamia doesn't have the age thing, but I think it was odd for her, too, as, as uh, we go along. So being a freshman is uh, a lot of learning, which we were dumped into quite fast. It was one apparently one of the quicker starting sessions and um, certainly a session filled with all sorts of interesting and important challenges. Um, I did get a chance to serve uh, on the CRC committee and we did a great job I think and managed to pass that legislation. Uh, unfortunately Washington let us down so it'll be very interesting to see what happens now with CRC. Uh, hopefully we will find some way though to move forward since we do need to preserve um, the I-5 corridor is a viable uh, route, not just for passenger cars going back and forth between Vancouver and Portland, but also for freight traffic, and of course that deals then with business issues and all sorts of important things. So I hope we're not completely dead in the water, although right now it would appear that way. But um, I did get a chance to do a number of things, and... Um, one of the things that I've been very interested in, uh, well, probably since I was on the Troutdale City Council, has to do with transit, and you may have seen a couple of little pieces of information about my um, endeavors to deal with TriMet. 
Um, I'm not a TriMet hater, by the way. Sometimes people think that. Even some people in the building have accused me of being a TriMet hater. Uh, no. Uh, I like buses and trains, and I think they're an important part of, of how we get around, including our cars. Uh, we need a balance of all of those things. But I think we do have problems at that, at that agency. And uh, so my first go-round, as you may have seen in the Oregonian article, was to try and change the board makeup since it's an appointed board and I thought bringing it to local officials to appoint might work better. Um, but as frequently happens in the legislature, your colleagues don't always necessarily think that your idea is the greatest idea on the planet, even though you do. And so that situation died a quick death. And then we were able to resurrect it. And so what I hope we're going to be able to um, accomplish now with the Secretary of State's audit is to look very carefully at TriMet, at all facets of TriMet, so that we can find out the good things and we can also find out the problems and hopefully then make the agency better and keep it solvent so that it doesn't fail. Um, as some TriMet officials have indicated, it, it may very well in the future, in the next few years do. So hopefully we'll get something very positive out of that. Um, I also had a little bill that was very much helped by my good friend Senator Thompson, and that's a bill to um, explore the use of photo radar in school zones. And we are going to do a pilot project, this passed through the House and then the Senate, where we will look at a school zone with photo radar in the Fairview City, um, one of the school districts there, one of the school buildings. And uh, the belief is that what we'll find is that by having that and having it very obvious to people that it will slow people down. And if it truly does that, then hopefully we can extend that idea to other school zones in the state. So um, that's another thing that we managed to get passed through, so I'm very happy with that. And um, the last big thing that I did relates to community colleges. Uh, we are going to um, be involved in a statewide, system-wide um, look at how we can cost-effectively offer child care for community college students um, who are struggling with debt, struggling with jobs and families. Um, and we don't want child care to be an impediment to their success and their uh, ability to get a degree and contribute to the community. So that's another piece that we're working on. Uh, other than that, um, Hopefully, I certainly have tried to be uh, available to uh, local officials. I think that the only way we uh, solve our, our problems and make things better is by being connected to people like uh, Mayor Be Bemis and, and others. And so uh, I hope to continue that process. And uh, it is an honor to be here. And thank you for inviting me today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representing House District 50 is Representative Greg Matthews. Greg is serving in his third term in the House, and in, his, in this session he served on the Business and Labor Committee, Public Safety Committee, and also served as chair of the Committee on Veterans and Emergency Preparedness. Representative Matthews, as we all know, is a lieutenant in the Gresham Fire Department, and with his wife Suzette, owns and operates Small World Learning Center here in Gresham. To give us his perspective on the legislative session, please welcome Representative Greg Matthews. Thank you, Andre, and uh, thank you all for having me here, and thanks for being here. Uh, so it's my third term, and the session started off with a, a whole lot of expectations. And those were laid out by the governor out through the media and through the press and, and telling everybody what we were going to do. And in some of those areas, we had K-12 through funding. In some of those areas, we had reform in public safety. Uh, having been a member of the public safety, I want to tell you that the expectations the governor laid out for us were unrealistic. They were, they were difficult to, uh, to even talk about. Uh, they in, involved some uh, serious uh, revisions to Measure 11, which uh, obviously don't vet really well in the community. So, again, high expectations there. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we did there. Uh, I'll talk just a little bit about going into the, going into the session with priorities uh, that I took with me, I guess. Uh, First and foremost, I always try to work hard on MGET funding, which is, of course, the Gang Enforcement Task Force. It's important. The mayor knows how important it is. Our council knows how important it is. Our neighboring communities all know how important that funding is. And uh, proud that uh, Representative Gorsuch and 
uh, Senator Martin Sanderson uh, joined in the effort. And so we were able to secure that gang funding uh, relatively early with the commitment, but it always comes through on those final weeks. But uh, good to do. Uh, really important to the community. It uh, didn't hurt our cause that we had a fatal shooting, uh, actually a double homicide that was just uh, about the same time we were talking about just how much can we come up with, uh, and we came up with the full ask, which is really important. Being the chair of the Veterans Committee, I want to tell you, it was really an honor to have a gavel uh, to be the chair because you can start to direct some policy. Veterans are an issue that I love working on. Number one, they're not partisan in nature. Uh, we don't get into these bickering moments. Nobody takes our bills hostage, and, uh, and you can do a lot of good work on behalf of the folks that serve us. And, uh, and so being a veteran myself, again, I, I hold that real high uh, in, in terms of uh, pride and privilege. Uh, as the vets chair, uh, able to, to be a part of a group uh, that was able to pass uh, a serious uh, housing bill for veterans. And this will be, it's a $5 document recording fee per document, but those dollars are going to be dedicated towards veterans housing. We have a serious need for veterans transformational housing. We have a big deal on, on our veterans, uh, homeless veterans population. Uh, these dollars are going to just start to climb as every year goes, and we'll be able to address these needs. Uh, in that, too, is a, a veterans house in Roseburg uh, that's going to be uh, completed. Uh, just, again, a, a real important issue is going to be dealing with veterans housing. Uh, we had a no wrong door uh, priority that we went in. And I want to say Zach Reeves, who's over here near the back. Zach, raise your hand. Uh, Zach, did, he works with me in Salem and does a phenomenal job. And the talent that he brought uh, replacing Derek Bradley, uh, I, just, I could not be happier with his performance and the work we did. So when I say we a lot, it really means Zach and, uh, and also the other legislators that helped kind of pull on the rope. But the no wrong door basically is anybody now in touch with uh, ODOT or DMV or DHS programs, or BOLI, the Bureau of Labor, uh, will be asked if they're a veteran. If they are a veteran, they'll also be asked, can their name be forwarded to the ODVA, to the Veterans Administration? If the answer is yes and they want to be forwarded, the ODVA will then search their name to see if they're accessing the benefits that they've earned. That's a huge issue. There's $4.2 billion of federal money waiting for our veterans access. We've got 330,000 plus veterans in Oregon. We have about 100,000 of them are accessing benefits. We can do better, and we have to get them in touch with that. And if we do, we can maybe take them out of some of the county programs or state assistance. And so that's the effort there, and, and, and proud to be a part of that. Uh, in-state tuition for veterans. Now, if a veteran moves to Oregon and intend to live here, they'll be charged the in-state rate for their tuition. Again, uh, a monumental bill we've worked on now. This was my third session. This year, somehow, it happened. I would have thought we could have done it last session in the uh, bipartisan fashion, but it just couldn't get through. This time, we were able to get that done. Uh, and then in the closing days, uh, Peter Buckley, phenomenal job as the chair of Ways and Means, uh, and uh, Richard Devlin, they set aside $350,000 uh, directed towards suicide prevention for our veterans. Absolutely critical, very important. I hate to admit it, I wish it wasn't so, but it's true. Uh, we have a real issue with the veteran suicide, and, and to be honest, you know, think about calling a helpline that's shut down uh, when you absolutely need their service. Uh, so uh, excited about that and really thankful for that. Uh, as the emergency preparedness, we looked at the resilience plan. There's been a strategy on resiliency, figuring out what's going to survive in Oregon. If we hit the earthquake, if we, if we have a tsunami, what's going to occur? Who's going to lose? Who's going to win? Uh, who's going to be safe? Who's in danger? All this has come to a forefront, and it's millions and millions of dollars to spend to try to help make this happen, but there's been no prioritization of the dollar. So we're going to have a resilience. Uh, we've, we've passed through. Uh, a resilience uh, committee that will be studying that effort and bringing back a proposal to the legislature to say, here's where the risks lie, here's how we assess them, and here's how we should move forward as a state. Uh, again, looking forward to that. Now, public safety. Public safety was really probably the least sexy of any assignment that you could ever be given. Uh, but I got to tell you, I was so proud to serve on that committee with folks like Andy Olson and Wayne Krieger, uh, Floyd Przanski, uh, Chris Garrett. I mean, we just had a number of folks that were really dedicated towards diving into this thing. Again, the governor said we could save all this money. And he told us, here's how, you know, here's what you probably have to do to get there. But it just wasn't looking like we could ever get the support. I certainly didn't want to do that. I didn't want to release the violent offenders, even though perhaps in this plan I'll still be told I did. But, but the, the bottom line is uh, we worked all the way through the final week of the session to get on board, to get to a position of either neutrality or in favor, our district attorney's offices, our sheriff's offices, our chiefs, uh, our uh, law enforcement agencies, our, our, our law enforcement personnel, the counties, the cities, the uh, uh, victims' advocates, with the exception of one, 
and we came up with a plan and the proposal. It's really unfortunate. Wish we would have got 60 votes out of the House. It became partisan in nature. Shouldn't have been. It's a really great plan. Over the next decade, $362 million will be kicked back into local communities for the programs that start dealing with crime. Keep in mind, $30,000 a, a year to uh, incarcerate, $10,000 to educate. That's a big difference. Um, I will say uh, I was proud to be on Business and Labor Committee this session. It's probably not what I did that you're most interested in. It's what we didn't do. Uh, I stood up and, and said that it wasn't time to pass the paid sick leave as it was presented. It was really a bad plan to think an employee could take three days off without you questioning it. But if you question, uh, but, but if they call the state and say that you did question it, you'd have to give them, they have five weeks to give you an answer why they were gone. You have immediate results to turn over your information on why you gave them the time off. It wasn't a good proposal. I think, I think the concept was genuine. I think they're trying to get somewhere. But to be honest, the plan that was presented just wasn't, wasn't good. And last thing was delis versus casinos. Working on that issue. It's easy to say that's what's happening. That's not exactly the case. Worked on Lottery Row, and I'm getting to sign my times, times up. But instead of create a bill that created some sort of statute throughout the uh, entire state, I applaud Speaker Tina Kotek for allowing me to chair a subcommittee to deal with the issues at Hayden Island so that we could fix that problem specific to Hayden Island without a large bill draft that would affect everybody in the state. I think it was the right way to address that. We did good work on that. And again, uh, thanks. Real privilege and an honor to serve Gresham in this capacity. Thank you. Thanks, Rep. Matthews. House District 51 encompasses North Clackamas County, Southeast Portland, and now Southwest Gresham. You are actually sitting in House District 51. Representative Shamia Fagan just completed her first session where she served on business labor and education committees and also served as uh, vice chair of the Committee on Veterans and Emergency Preparedness. Rep Fagan is also a graduate of Northwestern School of Law, Lewis and Clark College, and is uh, one of 12 attorneys serving in the legislature. That's only 13% of the legislature, by the way. So she, and she also serves on the board of directors of the uh, David Douglas uh, School District uh, Board. So to discuss her first session, please welcome Representative Shamia Fagan. Well, good afternoon. It's nice to take a break from my back of the law firm of Ader Wynn. And I was able to work from home this morning in my pajamas and a laptop. So I'm very grateful for that, if nothing else. My priorities going into my first session were simple. I wanted to give my son's generation the same Oregon that the generations before gave me. Because I grew up in little towns in eastern Oregon. My family was incredibly hard off. But because of great Oregon schools, I was able to work hard in school, put myself through college and law school, and build a career as a business attorney, a future that was absolutely inconceivable to me as a child growing up in a poor family. So my priorities were simple, to give the next generation that same Oregon so that any kid from any family has a chance to climb that ladder. As a business attorney, something that will be relevant to you, one of the things that I did, Representative Matthews made a funny comment about what we didn't do, because sometimes it's not the big bills, it's sometimes the things that we don't do. But also, for me, it was the lens that I took to the legislature. As a business attorney, I can't tell you how many times I'm an associate, I do the research, a partner will come to me and say that a client called us, an employer, they have a particular situation, they want to know what the law is. Great. For example, a new employee has a particular ailment. An employer would call and say, we want to know if it's a disability. If it is, what accommodations do we have to make? No problem. I'd start researching. I'd look at the statute. Well, it wouldn't say. And then I'd look at the regulations, and they wouldn't say. So I would start researching case law to see if any judges have written opinions in Oregon on this particular topic, and, and they hadn't said anything. So if I was lucky, I might find a low-level court in the southern tip of Florida that had dealt with a similar issue. So we'd go back to our client and say, well, we don't know if it's a disability. We don't know what accommodations you have to make. And maybe a sim similar situation was dealt with this way. And then, of course, you still get a bill. And so one of my tasks as a legislator and on the Business and Labor Committee was to hammer the drumbeat, well, let's just make the law clear. Probably at many times to the annoyance and chagrin of my colleagues, we would have someone testify and somebody would ask a question and say, well, is it intended to cover these people? And from the dais, they would say, no, 
But the law wouldn't say that. So I would say, well, let's put that in the statute then. And so one of my jobs as a legislator, I believe, was to make the law more clear, to make it so that when you call up your attorney or maybe when you read the statute yourself, you can just read and go, oh, that's the answer, and not have to get a big bill from your law firm, probably much to the chagrin of my employer, but that's another topic. But that's the lens I had. The priorities I had were straightforward. Invest in our schools, economic development, and then responding to the needs of my constituents. Investing in education. We increased the school's budget by a billion dollars. I don't often get to use numbers with a B in them, and that was a pretty incredible opportunity. We could have done more. Don't get me wrong. We could have done more. There were negotiations up until the very end that unfortunately did not pass. But we could have done more, but to increase the education budget by a billion dollars was historic. It was an increase unlike the state has ever seen, and I'm proud that we did that, and that was one of the priorities I was happy to deliver on. Economic development. Now, we all campaigned on jobs. We all talk about jobs. But everyone in this room knows the dirty little secret, right, that the state legislature, in the midst of a global economic recovery, we can't do a whole lot to create direct private sector jobs. You guys know that. I think with one exception, the one direct way the state legislature can actually immediately spur job growth is investing in infrastructure. There are facts and statistics that show that for every one construction or manufacturing worker that you put back to work supports two and a half jobs in the service sector of the economy. So to me, I thought, you know what? I campaigned on jobs. My constituents talked to me about jobs. The most direct thing that I can do is to support infrastructure. And at the very last day of the session, I was proud to vote yes to pump a billion dollars into the state of bonding dollars all across the st state from large projects like $40 million for Connect Oregon to small projects like $3.5 million for sidewalks in East County. But either way, it is putting construction and manufacturers workers back to work, and they are going to then fuel the economy, and the ripple effect is going to be significant and real. And so that was something I was proud to do. Finally, responding to my constituents' needs. When I, I have a very vast district. I have all the way up in East Portland and Gresham, and then I have all the way down to Damascus and Happy Valley. Very diverse needs. But when I knocked on doors, people pretty much talked about jobs and our schools. But they talked about a couple of other things. In East Portland and East County, they talked about sidewalks. They talked about Powell Boulevard. And so I went to work right off recognizing that we have got to, as a state, take responsibility for Highway 26 or Powell Boulevard. It's a state highway, and it is nothing less than neglected and orphaned, which is not good for the folks who live on there, not good for the businesses that want to develop out there. And so I went to work on that with, actually, I think everyone here was a member of the East Portland Caucus. We kind of formed a caucus after the tragic death of a little five-year-old girl on a street on Southeast 136th in Portland. And so we were able to come together and actually fund a sidewalk project all the way from Foster to Division on Southeast 136th and Powell, or excuse me, 136th between Division and Foster. But in addition to that, I continued to fight for Powell Boulevard money because, yeah, I'm happy that we were able to deliver sidewalk money, but the fact is a little girl died. And I think as leaders, the lowest form of leadership is when we respond to a tragedy. Because let's face it, it's easy to get the money then. It's easier. But we need to be preventing tragedy. So I continue to fight for money for Powell Boulevard. And we were also able to secure $5 million for Powell Boulevard to actually put Powell in a position to be a big winner in the state's next big transportation project. So those were some of the things affecting East County that I was working on. And in the end, I'm proud of what we accomplished. And... We put together a lot this session, but like my colleagues will tell you, we didn't get to do everything that we wanted to do, and that's disappointing. But in the end, I think that's what makes us legislators and not kings, and I'm happy to go back next session and continue to work hard for you. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Fagan. From House District 52 is Representative Mark Johnson. Mark's territory extends from Hood River all the way to, eastern, to the eastern part of Gresham. Currently serving in his second term, Mark serves on the Higher Education and Workforce Development Committee, Consumer Protection and Government Efficiency Committee, and also as Vice Chair of the Energy and en Environment Committee. For over 25 years, Mark has owned and operated his own general contracting business in Hood River, and is also serving his third term on the Hood River County School Board. Will you please welcome Representative Mark Johnson.
Hi there. It's great to be here today. It's nice to be in this venue. I uh, would have been here sooner, uh, but um, thanks to Representative Gorsuch's bill, I had to evade their photo radar, so it took me a little longer. <laughs> it took me a little longer to get here. No, seriously. Uh, thank you, Allison and Andre, for uh, hosting us out here. It's great to be here. Uh, this was a much different session than my first session, and uh, the election of November the 6th uh, had a little bit to do with that. You all will remember that uh, last, last time we had an even 30-30 split in the House. Well, that uh, changed after, after November the 6th, I believe it was, and now I can proudly say that Senator Thompson and I are the only last two Republicans standing in Multnomah County. So things changed. It was a different session, uh, which changed the dynamics. Last time we had go co-governance, and most of the uh, legislation kind of stayed between the 40-yard lines. Nothing too wacky on the right, nothing too wacky on the left kind of got to the plate because it just was, was an agreement to let that happen. This session a little bit different from our perspective. Uh, there were certainly some bills that were uh, a little outside of the box thinking that uh, got hearings and so forth, and then there were some other bills that uh, we would have enjoyed seeing have a little airplay that didn't. But, uh, you know, that's the numbers game. That's what happens, and uh, you just deal with it. But uh, dealing in the minority, uh, sometimes you have to do what you can do, and you take advantage of certain situations as they present themselves. I call it legislating in the margins. You take advantage of those situations where you can grab allegiances or alliances of certain individuals, bipartisan groups, to try to get some things accomplished. And that's really what I tried to do this session because in the minority, you can't just unilaterally say, this is what I'd like to do. Let's have a hearing. Let's have a work session. And please, would you give me this bill? So, so that changed a bit. But uh, again, it was a learning experience for me. And all of us, I think, in the Senate, at the end of the session, came to say, thank God for Betsy Johnson. Because Senator Betsy Johnson uh, single-handedly helped to stop a few of those things that for us in the House, uh, we would have liked to have seen uh, maybe some better discussions about things. But because of she had some different ideas and joined with Chuck and his colleagues there, they were able to stop some things that perhaps I think wouldn't have been quite so good for Oregon. So overall, as I look at the session, you know, it could have been a lot worse. But overall, it wasn't all that bad because we really did uh, try to stay uh, on track, try to help uh, as Oregonians as much as we could. And I, and I won't uh, try to re replow some of the same ground that's been talked about thus far. But, but being an education guy, I am now starting my third term as a school board member in Hoodera County. And education and education funding and education policy is something that I'm very, very concerned with and it's something that I, I'm very involved with. But uh, I do think that the K-12 budget, as Shamia talked earlier, was, I think, a real turning point, I think, for funding in public education in Oregon. I'm really confident that there, we've drawn enough attention to our lack of funding of public education that from here on forward, we will not backtrack. I believe Oregonians in mass agree that we need to fund our kids and fund our schools and fund our teachers as much as we possibly can. The thing that we forget about, however, is that often that, that money comes from the general fund. So unless there is economic growth, unless there is commerce from all people like you, we don't have those necessary resources. So it's one thing to say we want to spend money on kids in classrooms, but it's another thing to be advocating for pro-business policies, which need to happen. And I'm hopeful as we continue forward, we'll continue to do that. On the higher ed front, which uh, I am on that committee and have been very involved over the years, we, we've passed some really significant policy this session, one being Senate Bill 270. That's going to give the University of Oregon and Portland State the ability to create their own institutional governing boards, provide more autonomy for their governance, for their mission and scope and so forth, which is going to, I believe, attract some very significant private sector investment into those institutions. And I think you're going to see some exciting things happen. It also provides a path forward so that our other universities, if and when they want to choose that path can do that as well. So that's going to be a game changer, I believe, for higher ed in Oregon. We also did pass a bill that's going to create some consolidations and finally some, uh, let's just say, efficiencies within the rest of our higher ed world, combining community colleges and universities under kind of a higher arching higher ed coordinating commission that I think is going to return some dividends and so forth. But. We've talked about education funding, but, uh, but education policy, I think we took a step back. We actually rolled back a few things that we passed in our 2011 session that I think give parents and give students some choice. I think we made a step back regarding um, open enrollment. Uh, some of those things we passed in 2011 were very, very uh, appreciated by families and students across the state. There are some more restrictions there that I didn't support, but others did. Some of the bills that didn't pass, and this is what you need to remember now, is yeah, talk to people about we gave this much more to K-12. You need to also talk to them about, well, did you support some policies that would have made school boards' lives a little bit more difficult? Because that, that is important. One bill that actually passed from the House 
would have create would have put any unresolved contract uh, issues okay for school districts in bargaining with their the collective bargaining unit they can't agree on all elements those elements that were unagreed to would automatically go into binding arbitration now those of you who have sat through a couple of sticky little situations out here with Reynolds and Gresham Barlow over the last few years I don't think we'd like to see more binding arbitration and more of that sort of stuff coming into the equation the bill passed the house but very fortunately it didn't continue on in the Senate so you have to ask folks okay if, it, if are you giving with one hand are you taking away with the other because sometimes that can happen regarding the bigger pictures anybody heard about Rudy crew <laughs> You know, this, this is a situation that really frustrates me because, and it's a situation personally I'm going to start to get a little more outspoken about because over the last three years, we've given the governor virtually everything he's asked for regarding education policy. We've made him the chief education officer. He gets to appoint people in very key positions. But what I think he's guilty of is a tremendous lack of oversight and a lack of accountability. And it's time, I think, for the governor to be said you need to exercise a little more hands-on involvement here, a little more oversight, because we can't have this waste of taxpayer resources going on, and we still have school districts that are hurting. PERS, again, um, a disappointment. Um, we had no PERS hearings in the House. The only PERS hearings we had were in the Senate, and they did pass one bill that uh, got makes a little bit in the way of some reforms. As you want to talk about economies, you want to talk about the impact on the private sector, PERS really is a huge impact. Yes, it impacts kids, but it also results in increased property taxes, increased local option fees, and so forth. So if we can do something, again, not to take benefits away from members that have it in their accounts, but just to put some parameters on the growth of this, we have to do that. And I'm very confident, hopeful, that if we can get back, if we can get back into a special session environment, that we can do what's necessary, because this really is the future of this state. I have a poster on my door. I'll just close with this really quickly. It's a very sometimes one word speak or word speak a thousand picture speaks a thousand words. Just a graph that shows the size of Oregon's pension obligations and its economy, and the size of Washington's pension obligations and its economy. We're virtually identical in the amount of money we have set aside for our public employees. The difference is the size of the economies. Oregon's economy is half the size of Washington. So we're trying to fund as, just as many pension obligations with half the economic value and boost to do that. Therein lies the problem. And if we want to be competitive, which I know we all do as we try to try to attract businesses, attract folks to come live here in Gresham and in East County, we have to have a public employee system that doesn't bankroll, bankrupt pardon me, our public sector. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Senator Lori Mondes Anderson has served in the legislature since 2000, with two terms in the House and now serving her third term in the Senate. This session, Senator Mondes Anderson served on the Consumer and Small Business Protection Committee, Veterans and Emergency Preparedness Committee, and also as chair of the Health Care and Human Services Committee. And we all know the Senator has de devoted her life to, um, to her professional career to health care. But she is actually related to television royalty. I've mentioned this before. Her cousin is Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. And if you're Simpsons fans like me, this is really important. The connection is her mother, Ellen, is a sister to Groening's father, Homer. Wow. Homer Simpson's your uncle. That is awesome. <laughs> so we please welcome the dean of the uh, legislative delegation of East County, Senator Lori Montez Anderson. Well, um, rather than being known as a cousin to the create, first cousin to the creator of The Simpsons, I really like to be known as the only nurse in, in the legislature. And I am the only nurse, and I have a very different perspective, uh, and as is needed in the legislature to have a, a variety of um, people there. And I am very, I am proud of what we were able to do in 2013. Uh, I served on the consumer protection business, small business and consumer protection. I am known as a moderate, and you have to realize a lot of bills did come over from the House, um, and because I was the only moderate Democrat on, on the committee, there were a number of bills that did not get out of committee. So uh, I just uh, need to know that I think all of us have worked to maybe squelch some bills, and I know that there are members right here on either side of the aisle here that have done the very same thing. 
But we did address some of the top priorities, I think. And I think in East Multnomah County, it is education. It is um, job creation and raising the incomes of Oregonians, and it is public safety. It's already been mentioned by Greg that we secured $1.7 million for the East Metro Gang Enforcement Team, and that was critical, and all of us were responsible for that. Um, my number one goal was, even though I don't serve on that committee, was to make sure that K-12 through education uh, could begin to stop laying off people and add maybe some school days back and reduce class sizes, and we did, as Shamia already said. Uh, we hadn't been able, we have passed the strongest uh, education budget in nearly 10 years, and that was $1 billion in new resources. So uh, we still have a ways to go. We did increase funding for community colleges, universities, and need-based aid for students. There was $8 million that went specifically to Mount Hood Community College, and that would include remodeling projects, which will create jobs, and also expanding student service facilities, and also centralizing things like academic advising, career counseling, financial aid, admissions, etc. We also, as been mentioned, approved many uh, capital projects that are going to bring a lot of jobs to this particular community. And we also took, and this is something new, a, a national lead in finding some innovative ways to support college affordability by placing the, it's called the Oregon Opportunity Initiative on the 2014 ballot. And I think all of you need to become aware of it. And this is going to um, experiment with a pay it forward pay it back. And it's a new model where students could pay for college with a percentage of their future earnings. It is going to be on the ballot and it will be up to the public to see if they feel this is a good deal for our students um, that want to go to college. As our economy gets back on its feet, job creation was, remained a top issue and it was in the legislature. We passed a number of important bills, but most importantly, um, I counted the bills that passed out, of, and there were 33 job creation bills. I mean, that's jobs and economic development bills, and and, and additional 19 more for the rural area. The rural area, as I think our two legislators to the immediate right and left of me, are uh, it, it, the economy is really, really far worse uh, there than it is uh, in the metro, met, metro area. But uh, let we I improved the access to capital for small businesses. We in increased the availability of industrial lands so that businesses can grow and expand in the state. Uh, we streamlined the economic development programs that give businesses a jump start. We also um, increased transparency for Buy Oregon. It's a program that encourages state agencies to buy more Oregon-made products. And this is a good step. I think, toward more transparency in government, and it's a step toward ensuring that this program is having a, a positive effect on Oregon businesses. We did pass PERS reform that reduces the PERS liability uh, by $2.6 billion, and that was with COLA reductions. We know we need to do more. Uh, we, when I'm talking to the superintendents at Centennial Reynolds or uh, Gresham Barlow. Uh, Gresham Barlow was telling me that they are uh, needing to pay an additional $3 million uh, to the PERS, um, to PERS this next session, and, and that's just not sustainable for, for them. As the nurse, um, I certainly took the lead on the health care bills and the human services bills, uh, and I worked specifically on 10 health care bills and seven human services bills. And I'm only going to mention uh, one and that was strengthening the Oregon's prescription drug monitoring program. One of the leading causes of death, leading causes of death here in Oregon is prescription drug overdose. And this uh, legislation addresses, addressed that issue. Again, I worked on mental health and primary care. That's a big concern across the state, and we passed a number of bills focusing on that. And as our population ages um, and the need grows for health care in rural areas, we took steps to address the health care uh, workforce shortages and improve care across the state. I'm not getting into the details of it, but a number of bills that focused uh, on the senior issues also. 
Coming up for small businesses is the Oregon Health Insurance Exchange. It's called Cover Oregon, and it's critical to the future of our state. And if you want more information on that, businesses will be able to go online and uh, be able to compare insurance uh, and what they want for their employees to have uh, or what they want as a copay. I mean, the, and there are subsidies uh, for that too for the businesses. It'll be a very important for you to get involved with that. I want to thank um, Scott Hansen and I know Lori Stegman and Sue O'Halloran and oh, I'm missing some who actually contacted me on specific pieces of legislation. That is so so very uh, important. So um, I just got the signal that I'm up, so I won't go into veterans' issues, uh, but I think uh, I am vice chair of the Veterans Committee. I worked really hard on some of those issues. But I, there is a lot more that we have to do, and I, I think we've delivered uh, a big portion of it, but, oh, boy, we have an even bigger portion to address in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Last up is Senator Chuck Thompson. Senator Thompson represents Senate District 26, which includes property in Hood River, uh, Hood River County, Clackamas County, and Multnomah County. Elected in 2010, Senator Thompson is uh, serving his first term and has served on the Tr Business and Transportation Committee and Ways and Means. Senator Thompson is a volunteer firefighter with the uh, Pine Grove Fire Department and also owns and operates Thompson Orchards, the largest pear orchard in Oregon. If you please welcome Senator Chuck Thompson. Well, I, I don't think we're the largest pear grower in, in Oregon, but thanks for that, Andre. Maybe per acre, per, per acre. It's just because I bring him pears and he, and he gives me kudos, I think. Well, I, I don't know about the rest of the panel up here, but I'm just glad this session is finally over. Five months um, going to Salem, leaving home. Monday morning, staying down there till Friday afternoon, then making a stop somewhere in district on the way home. And then you get home and um, you, you got to pay the bills and do the payroll for the orchard and then spend a little time with your wife and try to get reacquainted after being down there. And we're all, we're the most important people in the world when we're down there. And I come home and my, I get home on a Saturday. My wife puts me out weeding. Uh, weeding by the fence. I said, Christy, I'm a state senator. I shouldn't have to do this stuff. But that goes nowhere with Christy. So I, I keep well grounded, and, and I think that's the best thing about our families is, is um, and, and it's important to do that. Um, I've, this is my second uh, long session now, and I've got a perfect voting record. I've always voted yes on the good bills and no on the bad bills. So I've done that uh, again, and I will continue to do that. Um, I think everybody's kind of given a summation of what went on. What are you laughing about? Uh, of kind of what went on there. I'll give you a little example of, of experience of passing, passing a bill. The, the bill that Andre mentioned, uh, it, it's was, it was if you own an LLC, you weren't covered in the, in the same way that you uh, normal businesses are under workers' comp issues. And, and in that, you could be sued civilly if you were covered under workers' comp as a regular business. Something was written when LLCs were developed that they didn't plan on, and LLCs, you could also be sued civilly. So once this court case came up, it was called the Cortez case, we realized that we need to make a fix for businesses to, to get that under the same statutes. And they started a bill in the House, and, and I, I started the bill, and Greg and Mona Sanderson sponsored with me because I think it was at a chamber meeting here that somebody brought that up that that needed to be corrected. So I, what you have to do <clears throat> as a Republican down there in the minority, you have to get, you have to make it bipartisan support. And Lori and Greg signed on with me, and that's what we did. And then I also know I coached um, some of it's a little inside information stuff, too, because there's in the workers' comp board, there's a board called the MLAC board, and it's a, it's a group between businesses and labor, and nothing gets through that um, board unless it's all agreed on, and then usually the business and business committees in Salem don't do anything that the MLAC board doesn't agree with. So I, I happen to have um, been president of our local uh, Little League 
for 10 years back in Hood River, and my assistant was uh, the chairman of the MLAC board, lives in Hood River. And then I knew a guy named Bob Shiprack, who used to deal with, um, was a uh, state legislator for years and dealt with workers' comp reform back in the 90s. And I went to him, and then I, I got in contact with the union rep of MLAC and said, this is really a big issue and we need to get this fixed. And, and so the MLAC board sat down and got it done, passed through the committee, and it made it through the final uh, days of session, um, and, and it passed. So that was, that was pretty monumentous, monumental for uh, business if you're a, an LLC. It, it's a big deal. But anyway, the, sometimes it's who you know and, and, and how you play well with others if you can get a bill passed in, in Salem. And in the last, I didn't see it so much this, the first session we were down there, like Mark talked about, when it was 30-30 in the House, it was, a, everybody kind of got along a little better. This year, the House side was a little more contentious, and, and they would, um, there was a lot of, like, bill trading um, type of issues that I saw go on that didn't, didn't happen the first time, but um, luckily, the, the best thing that, that, that I find that can kind of help, either help or not help get bills passed is the session actually closes and we get out of there and, and do less harm. Um, I, <laughs> oh, that's, that's really true, though. It really <laughs> is. Um, I'll give you a little, my little synopsis on the, on the PERS issue. I think as, as on the Senate side, we're 16, 14, so it's really close. And to pass a tax measure in in the Senate, they needed 18 votes, like two thirds, three fifths. So going into the session, the budget was supposedly off 270 million dollars, and so we we kind of had a little bit of back and forth to where if we wanted PERS reform or to get PERS reform, you couple it with some tax increases. So. So we already knew we were $270 million out, and the Republican caucus was willing to give up about $270 million and, and get a, a little better PERS reform. But about May, the May revenue forecast comes out, and amazingly enough, it was up $270 million. And so that kind of took the wind out of the sale of, of a grand bargain, in my opinion, because we didn't really need to raise taxes, and so it kind of fell back to where, and then we came up with an idea, Larry George and Brian Boquist in our caucus worked on a small business tax cut that would have saved small businesses a whole pile of money, and, and then that would be our kind of reason to, to raise taxes, because, you know, it, basically it was a, a per thing, the Democrats, you know, were don't want to, deal with that because they kind of represent the, basically the union folks and, and that's just the way it is and the Republicans don't want to raise taxes and, and that's kind of the Republican motto. So in order to get a grand bargain, everybody has to win and everybody has to lose and it just kind of ran out of steam in the end and we couldn't get an agreement and I, and I think the governor will, I, I will bring us back in to um, to deal with that, because even at the beginning, he, he tried to get a, like $800 million PERS reform, and we ended up with about $400 million. So um, I, I think what I've seen before, like we went, they brought us in, and we dealt with the Nike issue in three days back there. And I think if you put 90 people in the room and bring them back for three days, I think we can, we can get a PERS, PERS agreement this time. So... Uh, thanks for having me. It's nice to be out of session and back um, on the farm where life is real again. Um, and if, but if you have any issues and you need me to work on something, give me a call. Thanks for having me. All right. The floor is now open for your questions. You can address them all to our entire panel or to uh, a particular legislator. Please identify your name and business. I'm Scott Hansen. Um, local dentist. I'd like to thank all of you for the time and effort that you put in on our service down in Salem. I know it's not an easy thing to do to give up your time from your families and your jobs. Um, so I really appreciate what you do for us. Whether doesn't matter which side of the aisle you sit on, I really do appreciate all that you do. Um, PERS got a lot of talk this session, but my 
Several months ago, the Oregon Health Authority came out and revised their um, expected savings from $11 billion down, I think it was about $6 billion. So they had a, quite a reduction even before the whole thing starts going in the next 10 years. And with a 22% increase in the Oregon Health Authority budget this year, and with the feds cutting off their funding in 2020, PERS seems like a big topic today, but in the long term, it seems to me that that issue is going to be one that the state's going to have to face more than anything. What is your, all of your opinions on, you know, PERS gets the press, but I think it's that budget that's going to really have a big output on what businesses do in the state. Um, what is your opinion on, on that? I'll start it off since I chair the health care committee. Uh, as you know, we have, as this, uh, where the money is really, uh, our general funding money goes is to the Medicaid population. We, our taxpayer money goes to pay for the Medicaid population. And so what we have done over the last several years is form coordinated care organizations and they just went into effect last, uh, anyway, about a year ago. And so, the savings are already starting to occur there. And so, Scott, you know, only time will tell because with our new uh, coordinated care organization and with the care that's coming from the feds uh, that are they're going to mandate, there are a lot of mandates there. And so we, as our taxpayer money, are going to have to cover all of the, we call it, that's the Oregon Medical Insurance Pool. And that, those are the patients who no insurance will cover them just because of their disability or their disease. A lot of AIDS pa patients are under that. And so our premiums will grow up, but go up. Um, but we are starting to see significant fit savings um, and we will be getting reports it's too early but that's what we have to watch for because I do really believe that the estimates are we will be saving millions and millions of dollars so that will help it won't maybe necessarily solve but that will help we're gonna start over with rep Gorsuch if you want to address it and then we can move down the table oh at the mic please uh, I am not, I won't profess to be a medical professional or a professional uh, in the medical field in terms of how things are working. I do think, though, Scott, that you raise a very important point. We have talked a lot about PERS, and it's certainly important, um, but this is something that goes well beyond just public employees, and it is a serious issue. Um, and I'm disturbed, too, to see that we are suddenly seeing our estimates ratcheted down rather than up. Um, so we need to continue to work on this, but the exact policies, I will have to defer to my colleagues and wait to see that. But I think it's extremely important. And we've seen it with a number of bargaining situations around the state where it's health care that's really the problem. And it's just gone up and up and up. So I hope that uh, the senator is correct and that we will begin to see some, um, some real savings. But it is troubling to see that estimate change. Thank you for the question. I actually have seen, in relation to school districts, I've seen some breakdown of numbers. And again, PERS gets all the press. But when you actually look at school districts across the state and the unfunded liabilities of promises they've made to retired workers, oftentimes school districts will say, if you retire at 58, we'll cover your health insurance until you reach the age of Medicaid. Those are a, a vast amount of unfunded liabilities that are there as well. But just quickly, uh, because I'm not a healthcare professional, the CCOs or coordinated care organizations that Senator Monis Anderson mentioned in layman's terms, as I understand them, just because not everybody kind of understands in general what they are, is, is built on the idea that 80% of our cost is driven by 20% of the Medicaid population. And so what these coordinated care organizations do, at least in my rudimentary understanding, is that under our current system, your doctor only makes money if you have an ailment and you go see them. So if you need a knee surgery, your doctor makes money. If your doctor encourages you to lose weight and you don't need knee surgery, that's a very good doctor, but your doctor doesn't make any money making that recommendation that you lose weight. And so these coordinated care organizations are designed around the idea that instead of paying each fee for service, that each coordinated care organization, which is a group of healthcare professionals, will get a chunk of money. 
and they get that same money if all their patients end up being healthy and don't need a bunch of services, or they get the same amount of money if their patients need a bunch of services. So the idea is now the doctor that encourages you to lose weight so you don't need the knee surgery now actually gets compensated for that advice because they get the same amount of money whether they do the knee surgery or not. That's rudimentary, but that's the basic understanding and underlying idea of these coordinated care organizations to drive down the cost by actually including healthcare professionals and giving them incentives to have their patients actually live healthier lives. Yeah, thanks, Scott, for that question. Um, you know, we have as a state, I think, fully committed ourselves to following the federal example, i.e. Obamacare, on where we're going to go with the future. And whether it's going to work or not, I think, is still a very open question. It's We're committed. Uh, the state's committed to going on that path. But as you said, if those projected savings don't materialize, we're going to have some major budget holes. And I think you may not have to wait farther than the next biennium to start to see some of that show up. But what one of the things that frustrates me is that we actually had some initiatives this past session that could have, well, just to show you, the, illuminate the problem that we have. Right now, the Oregon University system has told us, and they were in, testified in front of our higher ed committee about this, if they could go out and self-insure and come out of PEB, the public employee benefit system, they have in hand documentation saying that they could save about $68 million over the course of the biennium. That's a lot of money, meaning that's $68 million that doesn't go on the back of students who are paying increased tuition and so forth. Uh, that bill went down in a straight party line vote. We also tried, we also know that a few years ago there was a thing called OWEB, the Oregon Education Benefit Board and so forth, which was supposed to be the best thing since sliced bread, putting all school districts into one big large pool and therefore it should also save money. Hasn't panned out that way. And we tried again to allow school districts to bust out of that, whoops, to bust out of that to go out and find policies on the open market where again they have, you know, actuarial analysis in hand saying they could save money. But again, we're all hooked into this notion that we're all going to be into this big soup together <laughs> and we're either going to sink or swim together. And that really is the nature where we're at. So good question. Chuck, you want to take a stab or you want to? Oh, okay. Uh, Rep. Matthews. <laughs> Just to address a couple things that came within the question. PERS was fully funded in 2007, and then, of course, some things that happened, but they had already done reforms years prior in, in other uh, sessions. And so those reforms were working out. We were fully funded in 2007, started to slip, started to slide, as the entire economy did. It's recovering. Here's what's happening now. The window of opportunity to make PERS the elephant in the room is closing quickly. And so now we have $270 plus million dollars in a fiscal revenue forecast that we didn't count on, and the only way to get to PERS would be to raise revenue through a tax increase. It's not the Republicans don't want to raise taxes, neither do moderate Democrats. I have no interest in raising taxes on people so that you can further cut PERS just to say we did. And that window's closing. So I just want to make sure that uh, that gets addressed. The other thing I just heard was a party line vote. You know, we had party line votes, a lot of them, because there were several efforts to move things directly to the floor. They call those procedural motions. So somebody stands up, they make a procedural motion, it votes down party line. Democrats say no, never got a hearing. Republicans say please, it's the only chance. It goes down, that's party line. Not exactly well vetted, not exactly hearing. My issue with health care is this. We're not addressing the real issue in cost. Right now as a firefighter, I can tell you, when I leave this room, I'll be going to report to duty at Station 76. We will undoubtedly go on a medical call of some sort, and somebody may decide that they want to go to the emergency room. They may make that choice. They may not need to go, but they get to decide. And they get to decide which one they go to. And so they're going to go to the ER in an ambulance. It's about $1,500. They're going to go to the emergency room, tie up a bed in the ER, and eventually that, that room will be what they call red when we call for a critical patient that absolutely needs the nearest hospital. It's very frustrating. We're not having that discussion because in Salem, everybody's too concerned about the liability. How can we relieve the paramedic on scene, our guys, from saying, I'm sorry, you dropped a rock on your toe yesterday. I know it hurts. I know it's swollen. But you don't need to go to OHSU. You should go to the urgent care clinic. You should perhaps have a friend take you, or maybe a BLS, a basic level transport. But a full-blown ambulance ride to the ER is not really working out. Now, that's my own perspective. I wish we could change it. I've been working on the issue. Dr. Or Senator Bates uh, and I have had a discussion. 
The problem comes down to the liability. And what happens if the person with the hurt toe, and I'm not making this up, it has happened. What happens if the person with the hurt toe has something happen to them while they're in a cab going to the hospital and it's cardiac related that could have been prevented? I have great faith in our medics on scene. I work with some outstanding people in the fire service and in ambulance support and transport. And I just think it would make more sense and could reduce some of that cost and that liability hanging overhead on a service that I won't say is being abused, but I will say it's being misused. I'll just throw in one thing. The, another thing they're doing in healthcare, because nobody mentioned yet, they, they have something they're working on called the Health Insurance Exchange. And that'll be coming up. Anybody know when that's starting? That'll be this October. And there'll be a computer system program run where you can go online and do a, like a one-stop shop and comparing insurance rates for your individual needs. And that hopefully will help the competition in that. And so you can see them all in one one little spot you can compare what's the best insurance for you and your family and hopefully that'll keep the cost down too. Lori Sigmund, Gresham City Council and also a small business owner for Farmers Insurance. So I, I wanted to thank all of you for representing us so well and I really appreciate uh, Senator Monis Anderson supporting the uh, exclusive remedy having to do with the workers comp that helps small businesses and Representative Matthews and those uh, else who, who uh, supported that measure. But my question is, is about the uh, lottery row. Uh, and you had mentioned, Representative Matthews, about that that was something that was more contained on Jansen Beach. However, in Rockwood, there's a lot. I mean, I see a lot of places that really aren't restaurants. And so I just wanted to maybe if you could speak to that, uh, since that's something that you're working on. I will, and thank you for your service, Council. I really appreciate it. I, so Lottery Row uh, it came about because of the folks on Hayden Island were saying that everybody over there is a casino. It's not a lottery. They're not selling delis. They're, they're not selling sandwiches. They're just operating as casinos. And, uh, and really what their frustration was was uh, there were a lot of activities that were occurring. There wasn't enough security out there. They were working with the Portland Police Bureau. Portland Police was very responsive but not able to really get things done came down to where we, we were able to, to, to step out. Now, here's my take on it. What they wanted to do is based on a percentage of gross proceeds and say if you made X amount of percent in lottery, that you were therefore a casino and not a deli. The problem is not, and, and, and I'm aware because the mayor uh, and I have had this conversation as well, uh, So and I'll be working the interim on this uh, and exploring these, these places. Uh, there's a place called Lighthouse Deli, and we have one in Gresham. We, there's another one in, in uh, uh, Clackamas. Anyway, we'll be touring and working with business owners to identify just what they can do to make it safer, but also who exactly is operating as a casino only, but for a couple bagels for sale and, you know, beverages. And, uh, and that is the issue. It, in Lottery Row, uh, the way the bill is written, really, it would have taken a lot of folks in rural Oregon that were very concerned that we're really struggling right now as a small business. And when I went into the session, I said, I want to do no further harm. And these small businesses were saying, you know, right now it's the only thing keeping me afloat. Without the machines in my deli, I will have to close this place. And I don't want to do that. And I was thinking, you know, I don't want to be a part of that discussion uh, and have those folks forced to close, but I recognize there's a problem. I'll be working with folks, to include our Chief Jenniger, I'm sure, uh, because it needs to be addressed. So I'll do that. Lottery Row, though, just so you know, the Portland police were able to, uh, they now have uh, each establishment has to have their own security and their on-site security. They agreed as property owners that they would pay them. I believe it's from 4 o'clock till closing. Uh, not all hours of the day. These things were occurring at night. Uh, they have to uh, roam not just the place of business, but the parking lot as well. So you have a lot of security. And they have to be uh, licensed, uh, certified security. So it's not like you can just hire a friend and rotate that spot through. They have to be licensed, certified security. Uh, Portland Police was excited about getting that done. It was great because the speaker was able to get a win there. But I'll tell you what the folks in Hayden Island, they're upset as well about the CRC. And so this just was adding to all of that anxiety. I think we've eliminated it. I'll be checking back with them in the interim, and I'll be working with folks in the Rockwood area and in, in the state just to find out, is the approach the right method? Now, I believe we'll be bringing something back uh, in the next session. Thank you. Any other legislators want to address that question? All right. Uh, we, have, we'll, we have time for one more question we can take. Uh, all right. Mayor? 
and uh, and for, and for the and for for this we and we'll start we'll start with uh, we'll start again with Rep Gorsick and uh, for time constraints we'll uh, please keep your answers to one minute. Representative Matthews, this is for you. <laughs> no, just just kidding. Well, I, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for uh, the service, and can certainly identify with uh, Chuck about being kept humble by our family. Appreciate that. Um, you talked a lot uh, about sort of the inner workings of Salem and, and the give and take and that sort of thing. As you look to the next session, can you, can you think of some specific things specific to Gresham, East County, of items that you want to move forward or areas where you can help, um, particularly as we've talked before, um, the constraints of local government around uh, being able to fund services? And I was struck, uh, Representative uh, Fagan, by the, by the sidewalk and, and putting in the sidewalks. If there's money for sidewalks, we'll be down there tomorrow uh, because we've got no shortage of areas that need them in the city. So I'm kind of curious as to going forward, what are the things specific to Gresham that we can actually have uh, outcomes to, not generalities in terms of economic development would be great and education would be great, but what are the things that we as a team, you all, your partners here can really rally upon to start to, to bring some deliverables back to the districts and to the city. Oh, uh, I'll just. Oh, I, yeah. oh okay. Uh, Senatorial I, privilege. Go ahead. There was an issue. There was an issue that came up this year, uh, very Gresham related, and and I don't even know the specifics to it, but it 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 was with industrial land or zoning, and and the Hillsboro area um, has a real benefit compared to this area. I, I think what I saw happen that that legislation pitted the two areas against each other. And, and the way the makeup of the legislature is right now, I don't think we're going to win with the, the strategy that was brought this session. I think we need to uh, get together and find out or find some a, a fix for it at our area here, but that won't change what they're doing on that side. Because when it, when you pitted both sides together, you, you you're going to have a, a winner and a loser. And I, I think we need to get together. And and I think I said um, sometime during the session, our East uh, County delegation has to get really mean about that. We need to get together, do it all together, and come out, come up with a solution that just affects Gresham that won't um, change something in another area of the state, but it'll just benefit you. And 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 I'm sure we'll all work on that. And I, and I'd be glad to lead the cause on that. Yeah. Hmm? I'll be the chair of that committee. Oh, perfect! That's excellent. Actually, you took my idea. I feel really bad now. Uh, but I want to work, uh, definitely want to work with uh, the senator and anybody else from the East County area. Uh, we have a lot of really excellent prospects here. If you look at the uh, Gresham Vista property uh, that the Port of Portland is now heading up, you look at um, our, uh, I can't think of the name of it, the uh, yeah, the trip property, there's another one, uh, and a number of others where we have the land. It's not a question of not having the land, but with those sorts of disadvantages like we see between Washington County and Multnomah County, um, it makes it more attractive. Um, several times, uh, transportation and economic development, we'd have uh, entrepreneurs come and testify before the committee, and they're saying, well, we were looking for this piece of property. And so I would say, well, have you looked at Gresham Vista? Have you looked at East Multnomah County? And it's like, eh, you know, we're, we're looking at Washington County. So we need to do whatever we can, and you're absolutely right, um, Senator Thompson, to fix that. And I certainly want to work on that, too. In fact, I was very disappointed to see that particular, uh, oh, got to stop, uh, to see that particular piece of legislation not go forward, because I really wanted to see that happen. Um, the other thing is, we have some exciting things that are going to happen at Mount Hood with all of the colleges in the state, community colleges, getting uh, money for different uh, capital projects. And we have gotten a capital project as well uh, for student services, as I think uh, Senator Anderson uh, uh, talked about. That will also be something that helps in the short term, at least, with uh, construction jobs and so forth. 
and, um, and there's just so many other things that we can do, but, but those are a couple of really big ones for me. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the question, Mr. Mayor. I don't approach my job as a legislator as, ooh, what, you know, what little piece can I get for Gresham that I got to get something for Damascus and that I got to get something for Boring and Happy Valley. I looked at it more as when I knocked on people's doors and had face-to-face -face conversations with them in people in Gresham or Happy Valley, what were they asking me to prioritize? So I went and prioritized those things. And the reason I prioritized sidewalks in East Portland is because when I knocked on doors in East Portland, that's what those constituents talked to me about. And so as much as it seems like a generality, I do hope that we can actually, with a positive May – or excuse me, a positive September – forecast actually boost the school's budget because when I knocked on doors for families in Gresham, they talked to me about school funding and they talked to me about economic development. And one interim work group that I'm actually leading because I we made an agreement with a kind of a business community group on a bereavement leave bill because we had a bereavement lead under the Oregon Family Leave Act and the kind of the agreement that I made for them to not fiercely oppose that was that I would work in the interim on a work group to look at the conflicts between the Oregon Family Leave Act, which is our state-specific law regarding leave for employees, and our federal, and to kind of work to minimize conflict. So while it's not, as, it's not Gresham specific, because I just don't view my job as a legislator for picking up a little piece for this district, I go out there and I say, what did these people, when I was face-to-face -face with them, ask me to prioritize? And the folks in Gresham asked me to prioritize the same thing people in Happy Valley did, same thing people in Damascus did, which was you know, my kids' class size is too big, the programs are too small, and we need to make sure that we have the funding for our schools. So I hope that with a positive revenue forecast in September that we can actually boost the school's budget, which is going to be one of my top priorities going into February. If you've been in the legislature for a while, uh, I take a little different tack. Uh, we have, at the end of the session, called the Christmas tree bill. And we have never had money to use a lot of, I'd say, pork projects. Well, there were a lot of pork projects this, this legislative session. And so it would just made me mad that I didn't have certain projects that I needed a few million for, or a couple of million, or 500,000. And so I want to have you come to me. What are some significant I call them pork projects that you would like. I've already talked to the PAL Center. You know, uh, th that is so important. It almost went away, and then the trailblazers came forward and really helped out uh, with allotting money for that. I am working with the people there, and I'm going to see what kind of money uh, that maybe the legislature could put into that. That is something that we really need to have for our area. And then we have the um, uh, arts, you know, how important the arts are. It's very more difficult now to focus on some projects, but if there are some unique projects in the community that you feel we need money, I want to know, because then if there is an extra revenue, I, it is a Christmas tree bill, and if I ask for a budget note, I want it. I'm going to be there, and we can get all of us together saying this is something that the community really wants. So if the city can focus on it, if the arts or, or, or the chamber have certain – or sidewalks, please, um, um, you need to come to me. I will meet with anybody, as you all know, and let's work on what specific specifics that we want for our community. Well, I don't think the good senator was calling Shamia sidewalks pork, but maybe she was. Um, <laughs> regarding economic development, um, you know, within District 52, we've got a couple of opportunities. It, what, it, what I'd like to get to is trying to look at regional issues more than just one, because I think as we float, a rising tide floats everybody's boat to a certain extent. And one of the things that Chuck and I work really closely together is natural resource development. And I think what sometimes folks don't realize, perhaps in these gateway communities like Gresham and Troutdale, into the gorge, onto the mountain, is that as we can do some significant things up the hill, if you will, it's going to bring people through these communities to buy gas, to maybe spend the night, to have a meal, whatever. One of the prime examples would be the lift-assisted mountain bike park up at Timberline. Be a world-class destination. It's the same replication of what goes on up at Whistler in Van, up at BC. People come from all over the world to utilize this thing, but we've got it's gone through 
all the ho- jumped through all the hoops. The Forest Service has twice said this thing is going to be great. It's going to be perfect for the area. The economic impact is going to be minimal. In fact, it will be better after they get done with this than it currently is. But yet you've got a group of three environmental groups that have got a judge to pull an injunction on the thing. So there we sit, waiting for this process to, to fulfill its completion, even though in the eyes of those people that know how to gauge these things, it's going to be great. So the point is, not only would that be great for the mountain, the villages, but it's going to bring people through your communities on the way there. You've got the same situation down the gorge here in Cascade Locks. Nestle, number project number one, wants to build a facility there that would put 50 people to work in Cascade Locks. It would double the tax base. Uh, it would be a tremendous boost for that community, for the schools, for everybody. If we can get natural gas from the Washington side of the river into Cascade Locks, there's at least three other economic development opportunities there that are another 150 jobs. If we can get that kind of thing going, again, it's going to put economic development close to here. It's going to put people coming through your communities. But, again, the same group that's tying up the Nestle project is the same group that's tying up this lift-assisted. It's called BARC. They live from right down here in Metro Portland. Um, that's who they are. Uh, that's what they're doing. So that's where, from my perspective, it helps to have a good relationship with the governor's office. So you can go to the governor and say, look, you need to make sure the Department of State lands, ODF and W, are doing everything they can do to streamline these projects, to get them out the door, even though you have one or two squeaky wheels that are kind of coming up the works, if you will. So I think it's helpful to take a regional perspective on some of these things, and let's, let's try to float everybody's boat. I'll take a different approach. I'm not going to take this from regional. I'll take it from just point center straight into my hometown community of Gresham. I love this town. 361 a 1,000 doesn't work for us. We know that. The mayor and council haven't had money to be able to do the things they'd like to do within this city. And when they go after other ways to find a way to fund some of the things that are real attractions to make this city special, people weigh in and they judge that differently and they say, why are you borrowing money? Why are you doing it this way? People don't understand the different pots of money that you can pull from. Senate Bill 19 was an effort that we could have used to encourage and and develop into Gresham. And by the time it finally got through hearings and had a couple of hearings, it was actually amended to the point where Hillsborough really wasn't disadvantaged at all. It didn't level the playing field. We were still behind, but it made it better for us. And it still couldn't get out of the Senate. It was terrible. It's unfortunate. I think here's what we need to do. Okay, and again, this is my hometown. If you live in this town, you're paying, like I am, a fee of $7.50 for our current levels of service. Okay, and I'm going to say they're not sustainable, and we need to do better, and I'm willing to pay more. I am. Pay it for my house, my business, my rental. Bottom line is this. I applaud what the mayor's trying to do in our council. I support him 100%. What we need to do as a community, Mr. Mayor, is with your leadership and perhaps mine and others, we need to look at the horsepower in this room and outside this room and the millions of viewers at home. And we need to get them to come into a term and to make a commitment towards projects that make this town exactly what I know it is, which is great, since I was a kid. We have got to get the horsepower so that when Intel picks up a phone and says, we got this covered, we have all these other folks that are saying, no, you don't. We're going to move this town forward, and that's what we have to do. I'm not going to do that for you. The mayor can't do it alone, and I can't do it. Trust me. We've tried to have those conversations on 5, 50, and 47. They go nowhere. We are hamstrung as a community, and the, most, the, the biggest problem is people don't realize just how bad it is. We can't educate folks to the degree we need to to get them to say, we need to do something. Every time there's a homicide, there's another this, there's another that, we start to realize that our town's changing. What I want to see is what the mayor wants to see in our council and the vision of this group, I'm sure, and that is better parks, not just parks, better parks. Better opportunity, a performing arts center that isn't just a a paved parking lot. Not even a parking lot. People can walk through. Saw dogs running around them yesterday. (laughs) We need to figure out what exactly do we want Gresham to look like. I know what my vision is. Same vision I share with my kids, and they're going to live here. They're never going to move away. Told them. (laughs) They're never going to date either. But the bottom line is, we the, the the bottom line is really, we can't just expect our council, our legislators, or anybody to do this for us, it's going to take a monumental effort of us. Not just one visit in Salem, a lot. Phone calls, relationships, the fact that this makes a priority for us. And if you're out there and your business is successful and you've got, well, you know what? Weigh in on it. 
because it'll help your business. The more that we can expand Gresham, the bigger town that we can become, and the more development there is, better opportunity in the schools, better opportunity for our businesses, and if you walk down Main Street, you'll see what's beautiful about Gresham and the fact that plans do work and we are on recovery. But it's going to take all of us. So to your point, Mr. Mayor, I don't know what the bill looks like. I supported Senate Bill 19. I thought it was coming to the House. We had been working on it and championed it and had a lot of folks ready to vote for it. We didn't get there. Maybe next session. But that's only one small piece of the puzzle. This is a huge puzzle. And I got to say, too, thanks to the legislative session last session, that 30-30 that was so great, I'm standing in Shamia Fagan's district despite being a legislator from Gresham. What the heck happened there? <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Greg Matthews. Well, thank you again uh, to our legislators for coming, and, and also thank you for your service to our community. Please take a couple seconds to fill out the evaluation forms to let us know what issues are on your mind. It helps the committee to uh, look at speakers and issues for the, for the future. And also, compliments of Riverview Community Bank. Please uh, take your complimentary mug uh, that's on your tables. Now, I just need to make a quick announcement. Our next Government Affairs Forum will be on a different date at a different location. We'll be meeting on Thursday, uh, August 29, at Fairview City Hall. Our guest will be... U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, and so we had that confirmed just a couple weeks ago. Uh, he'll be joining us for our Government Affairs Forum, and, um, and so we will be meeting at Fairview City Hall Thursday, August 29. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. We are adjourned. Signy die. Have a great rest of the week. That's good news. I love that. Yeah. <laughs>